They are the future of ASEAN, tech-savvy and on the move, creating a whole new consumer class. It's now two steps. You swipe and you go, and it's quick, it's fast. It's got to be intuitive. More than a third of ASEAN's 640 million people are aged between 15 and 34. We're one of the biggest brands in the world for the youth and millennial, and what better than one of the youngest uh, populations in the world? Creating opportunities, driving change. I like to say, if you can make it in ASEAN, you probably can make it anywhere. Leisure, lifestyle, e-commerce and leadership. Nowadays, fast forward, everybody's full of promise and passion, all this know-how from abroad. They are ASEAN, the next generation. Welcome to Bangkok, capital of Thailand, ASEAN's second largest economy, a country like the rest of Southeast Asia that's navigating an incredible rise in the internet economy, in a region that's pinning its hopes on a new, younger consumer class. With an average age in ASEAN of just 29, the millennials, the youth, are behind a booming middle class that's set to top 400 million people by 2020. That's twice what it was just eight years ago. I have to say the past 30 years have changed so much. Like when I came here and me being a Thai person that looks Thai and doesn't speak like hardly any Thai, people just looked at me so weirdly. I was like the ugly duckling. Weird. Nowadays, fast forward, everybody's full of promise and passion, all this know-how from abroad. We're seeing a lot of sea turtles come back. So meaning they're from Thailand, from Asia, from all over. They go abroad and they're bringing back all of their knowledge and their know-how and just so much passion to us. I think technology uh, will only accelerate whatever you have currently in a way that they make uh, things faster, better and cheaper. So for Indonesia or ASEAN for that matter, you, know, you have young people, right? And then you have hardworking people, very social, right? and they want to solve problems. So technology will only be positive in Indonesia and also ASEAN. So I like to say, if you can make it in ASEAN, you probably can make it anywhere, but not vice versa. All of a sudden, you know, instead of having to go through traditional forms of uh, building out uh, logistics networks or telecommunications networks, we're going to see 5G, for example, being rolled out uh, very quickly in the region. You're going to see um, huge amounts of digital consumption happening right from the get-go without that huge, uh, that long curve that comes alongside with it. So I think the, the critical period is really for the, uh, for the next two or three years over here in Southeast Asia, and we're going to see this massive upswing um, in the next 10 to 15 years, both in terms of consumption, both in terms of investment, and uh, I think the development of the entire region. We're in a place where we've got... Uh, a huge group of millennials coming back um, from where they've been you know, educated, you know, number one, or getting exposure in different countries. Um, but at the same time, we've seen um, a, a upskilling of uh, generations of workers that were never upskilled. Um, we, were, we were in a generation of people that were richer, well, much richer than we've ever been. Rachel Lau's father was the late Malaysian real estate and investment tycoon Lau Bunan. Together with two friends, also from prominent families, she's building what she hopes will become Southeast Asia's largest independent investment fund. For us, Southeast Asia is and will be the most interesting market and the most attractive market in the next 10 to 15 years because of pop younger population. We've got a generation shift of mindsets in terms of politics. Um, we've got um, huge consumptions, which again, we've never seen, but also a highly educated population that is migrating over, um, again, not just only Southeast Asia, but people moving over to Southeast Asia. And I think that's something we forget about. It's not just the people on the ground who are already here. There's people who actually want to move over. Um, and with that, you'll see more innovative ideas coming into this part of the world. If you think about it, uh, in the last uh, 60 years, you know, ASEAN has made a lot of progress in trade, uh, GDP, like to the tune of 20 to 30 times, right? But this uh, improvement can be made accelerated with technology because technology not only making faster, better, cheaper for a lot of things that you do, but it does solve a lot of problems uh, faster, better, cheaper as well. So again, I think when you look at Indonesia or ASEAN, the infrastructure issues, 
the payment issues, the, um, the uh, HR issues, uh, the capability, the know-how, those can be saved a lot uh, by technology. We're investing in the talent over here in Southeast Asia incredibly important for us. So we've just announced, for example, our Southeast Asian headquarters right here in Singapore. We've also announced a fintech hub for ourselves in Malaysia. So we've got right from the get-go hundreds and hundreds of people being trained, but we're also bringing talent from the Valley, talent from uh, our European headquarters over here to get this whole cross-pollination of uh, different people. So that's the midterm plan, really build up the talent across um, the entire region. Tan Meng Leong is a rising ASEAN entrepreneur, a self-made billionaire after the IPO of its gaming company Razer. Born and educated in Singapore, based in Silicon Valley, he's targeting Southeast Asia for the company's next growth spurt. Definitely we see Southeast Asia as a huge growth um, region for ourselves and for the company. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, the very young population out here and very tech savvy, um, hungry, I think, uh, for um, huge amounts of consumption for entertainment. That's something for ourselves at Razer. We think there's a huge opportunity for ourselves and it's really finding the right kind of product or service to cater to the um, population in the, the region. I'd say we're 10 years behind China in terms of evolution in digital economy, uh, but we're getting there much faster than any of our predecessors were. China or, or the US or the European nations uh, coming into the digital economy. So I think we're in the beginning, but we're moving much faster than we've ever seen uh, any of the other economies moved. And here's a sense of how connected Southeast Asia is. The Philippines leads the world in time spent on social media. Indonesia is number one in using mobile phones for e-commerce and the Thais leads the pack when it comes to browsing the net on their mobile phones. The way we've consumed or we've used the internet is very on the go and it's very mobile. Um, so we're a lot more mobile and more on the move as opposed to our previous generation. Um, so how I see it, it has to be faster, it has to be more adaptive, uh, it has to be intuitive in the ways. And so it's not you know, five steps, it's now two steps, you swipe and you go, and it's quick, it's fast, um, it's gotta be intuitive. I started getting in tech at Lazada before a second employee at, at Lazada is 2011. The pen, internet penetration was like 20% in Thailand alone. Today is probably like 70% or 80%. The mobile penetration right now, it's like something ridiculous, like 110%. That means everybody has one and a half phones each. We didn't have that 10 years ago. That's all that just happened 10 years ago. Nowadays, my, my husband, he, he's from Norway. He lives in Thailand. He doesn't speak a word of Thai, like zero Thai. he get anywhere. It's not just normal taxi Thai. He could actually do business. He could go talk to lawyers. He could go get new markets and whatnot. Like th there's just so much stuff that's, that's happened. That, and that's just Bangkok. <laughs> The size of Southeast Asia's internet economy is expected to more than triple over the next five years to a quarter of a trillion dollars as penetration rates continue to rise. That's next on ASEAN, the next generation. Welcome back. For all the opportunities the digital economy promises the young, ASEAN has still to capitalize and complete the journey. Because if it doesn't, the next generation risks getting old before getting rich. Internet penetration rates may be growing. And in some ASEAN countries, the percentage of people connected is quite high. But most of ASEAN still lags behind the developed world. In Indonesia, for example, while those who have it use it heavily, around 40% of the population don't have access at all. And then there's health and education. Is there a risk that Indonesia could grow old before it gets rich? Yeah, I think that's ba basically what uh, a lot of people are saying. If you are not careful, you will be trapped uh, as a middle-income country. So all this uh, nice prediction about Indonesia being you know, number five, uh, number seven in 20 to 30 years uh, will be uh, a fantasy. So now, and I think President Jokowi is focusing on that, we should focus on the needy greedies, uh, the process, uh, but also 
the uh, soft infrastructure. You know, people say demography is the key to success. But I think demography will be also the challenge uh, to succeed if you don't, you know, fuel them with the right uh, education, the right attitude. Anindya Bakri is the CEO of Bakri and Brothers, an Indonesian investment company that oversees the family empire with interests in everything from mining to telecommunications. For inclusion to materialize, you need equitable education. How do you go about getting there? After the infrastructure, which is basically the heart infrastructure that we see, uh, the bridges, the ports, uh, the roads, I think the next soft infrastructure will be you know, uh, health and education. But the question is, what kind of education will be fit uh, for the quote-unquote industrialization 4.0? I think that's the question. Because, uh, you know, not only we need to uh, have good students, but we also need, uh, you know, to train the trainers. I just came from a, a meeting where we were talking about how do you bring education across to the masses, right? Um, and I think that is definitely one of the things that the millennials over here are obsessed with. Because it's not just about work-life uh, balance. Um, it's about work, live, uh, play and learn. And I think the learning bit is something that it's not just coming from top down, but bottoms up too. You're seeing a lot of the millennials, the, the, the youth saying, I want to be at places where I can learn. I want to be at places where I can play, you know, at the same time. I just met up with um, three startups today, all education. And basically, they're not waiting around for the reforms of the Thailand Ministry of education anymore. Uh, this is the same issue in Indonesia, same issue in the Philippines. I mean, it's a pretty much same issue all over Southeast Asia. And basically what they're doing is they're cutting out, you know, the regulations and basically going back to what do you actually need to survive? Is it a college degree? Is it university? Uh, not everybody's going to be a Mark Zuckerberg, right? So that's like genius beyond recognition. But there are like key skills that you could acquire for yourself to actually make a living. Shannon, who co-founded her own successful e-commerce site for women in 2012, now advises the venture capital firm Gobi Partners on tech startups in Southeast Asia. I mean, people ask me all the time, are we going to see a unicorn? Well, you know, Thailand doesn't even have good grants to incorporate a company here in Thailand itself. So all of us startups, I, you know, just flock to Singapore because of the grants, like you said, right? So Temasek or, you know, all the spring and all the different initiatives they have. Thailand doesn't really have too many of those. Um, and because of that, the first unicorn is going to be a Singapore incorporated Thai company. The conversation today when it comes to startups mm -hmm. is between Silicon Valley as well as Shenzhen. Yes. Do you envision a time in Southeast Asia could be a big part of it? It's happening right now. You know, um, already you are seeing tech unicorns come out from this side of the world, you know, myself. But I not to the extent that we're seeing in China, for instance. Well, I think um, you'll probably see that uh, coming a long ways uh, in the next couple of years. I think, you know, you're seeing a lot more new tech startups come over uh, on the side of the world. Um, you know, myself, I think, you know, we're coming back from the valley to see what else we can do to invest over here. We are investing in companies over here, startups over here. So, you know, I do see huge amounts of opportunity right here in Southeast Asia. I think it's going to be a massive, massive opportunity. We've talked about how Silicon Valley could be overtaken by Shenzhen. Yep. Could Southeast Asia be a contender in that race at um, some point in time? Uh, I'd say yes. So, you know, I've spoken to some guys and they're actually moving some of their um, startups from the U.S. to Vietnam. Um, one of the reasons why is because you get very skilled labor for a quarter of the price. And so cost is a big factor. And if we're more competitive in this part of the world and we've got highly skilled labor, it, I don't see why not. What could hinder the what development? Uh, politics, probably. I mean, we've got to figure out how to deal with politics. How do we be more efficient in um, um, foreign workers movement? And so as Southeast Asia alone, we're not an integrated economy the way Europe is an integrated economy in terms of uh, free movement of labor. Um, it's not great in terms of currencies. You know, there's highly volatile currencies that can't really decide where they need to be. It's, it's really politics, which then kind of decides the rest of the landscape for Southeast Asia. The young, the millennials, increasingly becoming a problem for governments wanting to meet their aspirations. What are some of the challenges? Well, I think, you know, some of the governments see them as a problem. Some of the governments see them as an opportunity. 
Well, the thing about the young, the millennials, they're not getting their news or, or, or information from traditional sources anymore. You know, these are guys that, you know, um, they don't go to the movies so much, they don't uh, read the newspapers, they don't watch TV. Some of them don't even have a TV, right? So literally, what are they doing? They're entertaining themselves playing games. They're, they're very comfortable using virtual credits from us, for that matter. Um, over and above, you know, they're learning information from social media and things like that. So many of the governments today, they're learning how to re-engage with them. In terms of contribution from the millennials, how would you quantify that and in what areas? Um, and this is an interesting question, right? So um, I've had this conversation with a lot of people how Malaysia is doing in its economy given the new political um, regime. Um, I've said it's doing better than it's ever done, um, which is at odds with pretty much every economist um, on the street. Um, and the reason is pretty simple. When I go to uh, a boba tea shop, um, it's packed, the line's two hours wait. Uh, when I go to my nail salon, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a five hour wait. When first quarter GDP came out from Malaysia this year, and we're talking just about Malaysia, because uh, I'm domiciled in Malaysia, um, we've seen first quarter beat estimates um, by private consumption. And it's not infrastructure led, it's not uh, you know, public utilities, it's all private consumption. So in terms of spending, you know, there's a niche market which we have neglected, and this is the millennial spending on, on consumption goods. <laughs> Up next, seizing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. What the future looks like through the eyes of ASEAN, the next generation. I believe the ASEAN integration has uh, gone on as good as it could be because we have to be realistic. The 10 countries within ASEAN are at different levels of economic maturity. So it is difficult to pull them together and say, let us have one rule, let us have one tariff. Um, it, it's not possible to do that. ASEAN is going to be a big region because when you look at the growth, when you look at the stability, when you look at the demographic of people, these are all the factors that certainly uh, support the growth in this area. And when you look at the diversity of the economy in the region, Thailand are strong in one way, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar. Wow, you will see a lot of things that will come out of this region. The young population in Cambodia, they are young, very energetic and drive for education. And I think, um, Moving to this um, digitized or industrialized economy, like our government is talking about um, e-economy, so we need to build the capacity, their skill. That's why we have to reform a lot of structural reform in the education department and in the way how the industrial in Cambodia is going to be. There's always that risk that some people get left behind. But uh, I think if we all uh, look at the goals together, I think we will move towards, uh, towards more inclusive growth for everyone. You have to remember, I think all of us are realized that when the tide rises, all boats rise. So uh, we have to help each other uh, achieve that. No one really knows what ASEAN will look like in 10, 15 or 20 years. But with foundations in place, the outlook is good. The challenge now is for the region's leaders to take the next step. Does the current leadership in Southeast Asia reflect the aspirations of the next generation? Um, I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, you've got you know an average 70-year-old cohort of politicians and you've got an average 29-year-old citizens. Um, what they've been seeing or have done in the past you know, I admire uh, wholeheartedly, but I think there's been a lot of issues that they haven't addressed. Such as? Um, to your point, equitable education, uh, what is equitable and what is education? And, and education to a lot of people means different things. Um, the ways that we've uh, made a livelihood, uh, we, so in Malaysia, I've had this conversation with a government official multiple times. I said, invest in the tech economy because by investing in a digital economy, you'll be able to create more jobs than you ever thought you would. 
There's no questioning ASEAN's progress. It's been good. An average GDP growth rate across the 10 countries of more than 5% every year for 10 years. A rising consumer class, better wages, more jobs, more infrastructure. Booming e-commerce, but it's been from a relatively low base. Well, how do I envision Southeast Asia to be? Would be, you know, very basic things. You know, have great infrastructure, but have great software um, that supports the infrastructure. Um, have great regulatory systems, uh, political systems. Um, we stem out corruption and bribery altogether. Um, we have greater governance. Um, there's more accountability to the people and stakeholders involved, or the country as a whole. And how do we move forward from you know being um, playing politics and, and making politics about personal ideals, right? 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, how will ASEAN look like? I think ASEAN will be more confident, will be much more, uh, more confident because the numbers will show, right? The numbers is saying whether 10 years or 20 years, uh, ASEAN will be about 13 trillion uh, US dollar uh, economy. 13 trillion is about UK, uh, France and Germany combined. So when you have that kind of size, you are, you are, you are confident, right? And we hope Indonesia, as uh, the owner of 40% of the market share today, can grow along with it. I believe that in the next 10, 15 years, you're going to see a, a massive explosion of the youth coming from Southeast Asia, traveling outside of Southeast Asia, um, a lot more startups coming within Southeast Asia. And your dream for ASEAN 10 years down the road? I would love a common market you know, throughout ASEAN. I think it's important that ASEAN realizes that we are a huge market for ourselves. And unity is always important. And having a common market, I think that's something I would love to see. I would love to see over and above um, plurality of uh, companies moving across ASEAN and you know, dealing within ASEAN, not just as a common market, but, but viewing um, the people in ASEAN as a common people. But on inclusion, sustainability and connectivity, the last mile may yet prove to be the biggest challenge. I feel that in terms of the hustle and the drive and the passion to try to solve, again, the same mutual problems that we have, which is poverty, education, you know, um, sanitation, um, a lot of the getting retail access to the, the provinces. We have the same kind of fintech, you know, being able to have um, cheaper co uh, sources of finance, being able to pay your loans on time. We do all have the same obstacles, which means we all are trying to solve the same problems. So in terms of identity, I think, I think we're all kind of the same people, but we have our own little, like, what's the word for it, twerks. You know, it's us, you know, and this is our legacy. It's not our parents, it's not our grandparents. But we're saying, you know, there's too many unbanked population, there's too many things that the, the current financial institutions are not addressing. So how do we address it from a millennial standpoint, from a you know a younger Southeast Asian standpoint, and and to Southeast Asia, if ninety if, if the average age is twenty nine years old, then we are Southeast Asia, you know it's not the sixty year olds or the seventy year old politicians who are in place right now, right? It's us. It's the new generation coming up. For ASEAN, the future is here, led by a dynamic young population riding the tide of rapid change, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Thanks for watching ASEAN, the next generation.